A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11, verses 12 through 14 and 20 through 25. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. On the following day, that's after the procession into Jerusalem, when they, that's Jesus and his disciples, came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing a fig tree from afar bearing leaves, Jesus went perhaps to find anything on it. And when he came to it, nothing did he find but leaves. For it was not the time for figs. And he spoke to it, saying, Never again will anyone eat fruit from you. And his disciples heard it. Now they passed by in the morning and saw the fig tree dried up to its roots. And Peter, remembering, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Then Jesus answering told them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you all, if anyone says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but, be- but believes that they will come to pass, it will be done for you. Because of this I tell you all, All of whatever you all pray and ask, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you all stand praying, forgive. If someone has anything against anyone, so that your reconciler in heaven may also forgive you all your trespasses. For the word of God in its promise and covenant. Thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters matters. Inspire us now with the breath of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. What a text. Seriously, thank you, Dr. Will Gaffney, who I will see in a couple of weeks and will have a bone to pick for her, with her, for including this reading in the women's lectionary for the whole church. That's a sarcasm, a figure of speech. Seriously, this selection from the Gospel of Mark never appears in the Revised Common Lectionary. Go figure. (laughs) Jesus curses a fig tree for all eternity for not producing figs when it's not even the, the season for figs. This damned fig tree is just the beginning of our problems. The text is a problem. Jesus is an even bigger problem. Whenever a, biblical metaphor, or whenever a biblical narrator depicts Jesus or God in less than glowing ways, creators of lectionaries will sometimes omit the passage as if to say, oh, don't look over there, look over here. Nice Jesus, nice God. <laughs> no matter the lectionary architect, lectionaries are a curated collection that show forth an image of God Jesus and the people in certain ways. Because Dr. Gaffney has included this text, we are sent to discomfort. And we must deal with a story of Jesus that challenges our faith. Therefore, today may be the first and could be the last time this passage of Scripture is read and proclaimed from the pulpit of this congregation. Perhaps we'll figure it out. We'll have to see how it goes. 
For some time now, you have heard me say that we take Scripture too seriously to take it literally. And taking Scripture seriously is always of more consequence than taking Scripture literally. Imagine for a moment if we were to take this Scripture literally. Jesus curses a fig tree, and presumably the next day, Peter says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse has withered. Well, not even Roundup works that quickly, but I guess a curse from Jesus has immediate impact. Still, this first part of the story raises questions, like lots and lots of questions. First off, Jesus was hungry. And people who are hungry, who haven't eaten their morning cereal or even had their first cup of coffee, they are cranky. Believe me, I know. And cranky, cranky, hungry, and thirsty people can say things they don't often mean, especially early in the mornings. Second, what did this tree do? The tree is teeming with life. It is green. It is growing. It's getting ready to produce figs, but it's not yet the season. No matter the time, Jesus curses it. And his disciples, they hear it. Perhaps Jesus should listen to a soundtrack from Stephen Sondheim. Careful the spell you cast, not just on children. Sometimes the spell may last past what you can see and turn against you. Careful the tale you tell, that is the spell. Because children, the disciples, the people will listen. In the second half of our reading, Jesus exhorts his followers, have faith in God. Let me tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and doesn't doubt, it'll be done. Imagine taking that literally. Although there are no major mountain ranges in Ohio, we may think of the easternmost part of our state as part of the Appalachian Mountains. What what if we said to any of our high points in the state, like Campbell or Hulse Hill, Round Rocky or Jasper Knob or Durrell Mountain, off you go into the depths of Lake Erie. Said altitudes might look at us laugh and say, you and what army? We see the problems with biblical literalism. Next, Jesus says, whatever you all pray and ask, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Well, let's get this man a television studio, a clapperboard, and a producer to shout lights, camera, action. We'll make sure that Jesus has a head of hair that everyone can be proud of regardless of denomination or religious affiliation. A million dollar smile, a makeup artist, and a wife who hangs on his every word, builds a theme park in Orlando called the Holy Land Experience and has a collection of wigs so tossed and teased that it creates the unquestioned belief, belief the higher the hair, the closer to Jesus. We've heard such televangelists use these passages to exploit people's faith, belief, and money. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that placing aching body parts next to the television screen can be efficacious and healing. Don't try it. Whatever you all pray and ask, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Did Jesus mean for us to take these words literally? Well, If so, let's try his words on for size at Rainbow Children's Hospital or at the cancer ward at the Cleveland Clinic or at the person who is receiving palliative care at the Hospice of the Western Reserve. 
How far do we think we would get with these words of Jesus? Finally, Jesus closes his teaching with this. Whenever y'all stand praying, forgive. If someone has anything against anyone so that your reconciler in heaven may also forgive you all your trespasses. To take this passage literally sounds harmless enough. But we know all too well that many religious leaders have used this very passage and others like it to send people back into contexts of domestic abuse with the imperative command to just forgive. Of course, there are more nuanced ways of reading and understanding this text. Mark is a sandwich artist of sorts. I don't know that he would have been employed at Subway, but the evangelist could make a cold cut trio, figuratively speaking. However, if you were to ask him on the, one of the most pressing questions of our day, is a hot dog a sandwich? He would undoubtedly give you a look that could tell you where to go without passing go or collecting $200. A hot dog is not a sandwich, by the way. Mark crafts these narrative sandwiches when he starts a story, inserts some meat, seemingly unrelated to the story he just began, only to return to the initial story to complete this sandwich story narrative. Jesus does this when he commissions the, the 12 disciples in Mark 6. He sends the disciples out two by two, then tells them of the death of John the Baptist. And then the disciples gather around Jesus again for more instruction and a feeding. The beheading of John the Baptist is the meat of the story, meant to add new meaning to the call to discipleship. When we eat this sandwich, we realize that the lines between miracle and martyrdom, discipleship and death, are as thin as mayonnaise between the layer of bread and tomato. In Mark 11, the narrator inserts the story of cleansing the temple to the story of the fig tree. But Dr. Gaffney omitted it from our reading, but I'm going to tell you what happened anyway. Jesus drove out those who were selling and those who were buying. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is not it written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people? Amy Jill Levine argues that Jesus had hoped that with his presence in Jerusalem, the temple would change its nature from sin to sanctity, corruption to compassion. But the temple Herod remodeled remained true to its original nature. It did not bear fruit when Jesus appeared. Therefore, both the temple and the tree are rotten, cursed, and both will be destroyed. I think this is more or less what Mark had in mind, Levine says, and I don't like it. I don't like it either. Historically speaking, Mark is writing this gospel around the literal destruction of the temple in year 70 of the Common Era. The Roman Emperor Titus burned the temple, the holiest of holy places, to the ground. Perhaps Mark created this sandwich to help people understand a figurative relationship between that fig tree and the temple. Mark wants us to read this scene as a parable of judgment on the temple. That works, maybe, but I still have my doubts. 
I wonder if Dr. Gaffney left out this cleansing of the temple from today's reading because there is a history of Christian people reading the Gospels through an anti-Jewish or anti-Israel lens. Some commentators see the story of the fig tree as Mark's way of encouraging readers to pray for the destruction of the temple or, if it had already been destroyed, to rejoice rather than lament over its destruction. But as A.J. Levine says, the idea of rejoicing over the destruction of a place of worship, of the Jerusalem temple, the cathedral in Reims in World War I, London, St. Paul's, and Nagasaki's Yurakami Cathedral in World War II, Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963, the Church of St. Gregory in Venisti in 2022, yes, 2022, seems perverse to me. I hope praying for the destruction of any sacred place is perverse to us as well. If praying for the destruction of holy sites isn't enough, though, a few commentators go further than talking about the tree symbolizing the temple. They see the tree as representing the Jewish people, corrupt from the get-go, unwilling to change their nature in the presence of Jesus, and destined to be replaced by the church. We cannot go there, not for a second. Jesus did not come to start a new religion, but to be faithful to his own. So far, literal and the allegorical readings don't enable this sandwich to pass a taste test. We need another way to take this story seriously and faithfully. With A.J. Levine, there are plenty of passages in both Testaments that we don't like. But when we don't like a text, we wrestle with it. Difficult texts are always an invitation to wrestle. And if we wrestle with the text anything like right, if we struggle with it, as Jacob did that unidentified formidable opponent in Genesis, we may emerge with a blessing, not a curse. A blessing of figs, maybe. With the reading set out before us, we have the beginning of a sandwich, two pieces of bread. Jesus, who is hungry, approaches a fig tree and leaf, but there are no figs, as it's not the season for figs. And the second piece of bread is Peter's remark that the fig tree has withered and Jesus teaching about faith in God. Our problem, among many, is that we have no middle No turkey and provolone, no BLT, no peanut butter and jelly, nothing to help us determine what kind of sandwich this will be. Perhaps Dr. Gaffney gives us the option of making the sandwich for for ourselves. I'll have to ask. What if the meat of this sandwich, as it was for Mark, is our country, the United States of America. While we pledge liberty and justice for all, just as the temple was to be a house of prayer for all people, we are a nation that punishes the minoritized. Even with a biblical mandate to treat the immigrant as the citizen among us. Our current presidential administration has continued policies that deny the dignity of humankind and have placed increased restrictions on asylum seekers. Furthermore, it's an election year, as if anyone needed a reminder, and our political discourse has gone from bad to worse. 
We feel with each news broadcast and political advertisement that our democracy is on the brink of collapse, not unlike the temple millennia ago. What if Jesus has come to our borders hungry? He finds a tree, but it's not the season for figs, and he curses it. What if Jesus, hungry, thirsty, and destitute, has come to a country that has written at the base of its monument to liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door only for him to find that the lamp has gone out. Are we cursed? I want to state my emphatic position that our salvation as a people will not come at the hands of any political candidate, even though our destruction might. The future God wants and ultimately will have will not come on earth as it is in heaven because our political candidate wins in November. No, the kingdom of God will come not on the wheels of inevitability, but because of God's action in and through the church through people, disciples of Christ who have faith in God to act in the here and now, through people who can say to Capitol Hill, be taken up and thrown into the sea. Now, I do not recommend anarchy or domestic terrorism. We've already seen what that can do. Let us not take up arms as some are in the custom of doing. Instead, let's have faith in the Holy One of old. Let's pray even as we doubt. Let's ask for the future God wants and ultimately will have to come on the earth and believe that it is already here, already ours even as it is still on its way. Let's practice the holy and divine art of forgiving one another and ourselves, which will open us to the mystery of grace that meets us wherever we are and does not leave us where it found us. Then, Jesus, who is hungry, seeking rest, may come up to the doorsteps of a faithful people. He'll find a tree out on the front lawn, green and teeming with life, and growing on it, figs, lots and lots of figs. He'll pluck one and then another and then another and eat so many that his mouth and teeth will turn a shade of purple. He'll find here, too, a place of prayer for all people and a table spread that has gifts of grape and grain ready to feed the whole wide world. Jesus won't deliver a curse but a blessing. And from this tree and from this people, there will grow an abundance of figs. Go figure. Amen.